So what we're going to look at is what's called the first law of thermodynamics in this section. And we're going to look at, um, in part one, what's called the conservation of energy. All right, so thermodynamics, by, def by definition, we've already covered, okay, that interconversion between matter and energy. Um, and it's not just between matter and energy, I'm sorry. I said thermochemistry, and I was given the definition of thermochemistry, thermodynamics. That broader topic that we will talk about is that interconversion of energy. So it's not that interface between matter and energy like thermochemistry is, but the interconversion of energy um, is what thermodynamics is. So the first law of thermodynamics states that the total amount of energy in the universe is it's assumed to be constant, not changing. You're not getting more energy or less energy. So when processes are taking place, there is a transfer of energy, okay? So let's talk about this internal energy that we see here. It's going to be two things that you should have read about in 6.2. There is the kinetic energy and there is the potential energy. And those two things combined would give you the total internal energy. And we use E, and it's a capital E, to define that, okay? so. If we were to just kind of cut my hands and trap some gas in my hands there, there would be a certain amount of total energy in there. There would be energy associated with the movement of the molecules. There would be energy associated with the uh, electrons as they move about the nucleus. There would be energy associated with the nucleus itself, which we'll talk about much later, nuclear energy. So there's a whole bunch of different processes taking place in there um, and a lot of energy associated with that process and that total amount of energy is called internal energy. All right, we've got our definitions of energy. Let's talk about something called a state function. It is um, something that we utilize a lot in chemistry. A state function is a property, okay? So this is a property and that de it depends upon what state that substance is in and not how it got to that state. So it doesn't matter how it achieved where it is, once it's there, if that property is only dependent upon where it is right now, we call it a state function because it's dependent upon the state it's in. Okay, so here are some examples, easy ones for us to grasp on. Volume is a state function, okay? So if I had a six ounces of Coke, for example, all right? So I had a glass that had six ounces in there. That six ounces is six ounces, regardless of whether it started out as an empty glass and I poured six ounces in it, or it started out as a full glass, and maybe it was 12 ounces, and I drank six of them, okay, and I got it down to six ounces. It's six ounces regardless of how I got there. I could even drink, you know, nine ounces, spit three back in, and have six ounces, and it wouldn't matter how I got there. So the state function doesn't depend upon how you got there. It is just once you're there, can you measure that property, and if that property is what it is, regardless of how it got there, that's a state function. Now, it might seem right now, it's like, well, doesn't, isn't everything a state function? Well, no, everything is not a state function. We can talk about examples of how, how you got there depend, matters, okay? But we'll get there in just a minute. Okay, so whenever you're dealing with a state function, the magnitude of change for that function if you undergo a change, is always only need to look at the initial and the final amounts, okay? So let's talk about my weight for just a minute. No, let's not. Yeah, let's do my weight. Let's say that, you know, after I gave birth to my first child, I weighed 205 pounds, okay? And now I weigh much less than that, okay? So I could talk about my change in mass. And all that matters is, in terms of the change, is where I was then, where I am now, and I do a, a subtraction of that. Now, it doesn't matter that I've done this a lot along the way from where I was to where I am now. What matters, if I want to know the change of mass since I gave birth to my first child, I measure then, I measure now, and I subtract the two. So we use this symbol delta, delta V, the change in volume. Let's go back to our uh, Coke in a class for just a moment. If I drink some, I start 
at one point and I drink down to another point. So let's say I started with 12 ounces, went down to 6 ounces. If I want to talk about the change in volume, I just take the final minus initial. You always do it in that order. Final minus initial. That way if it increases, it's a positive change. And if it decreases, it's a negative change. So a delta V. Now this only works when there's state functions where um, the initial and the final is all you have to consider. Okay, anytime you're dealing with state functions, you will use capital letters. So we see a capital V for volume. When we saw the E on the previous slide for internal energy, that right there was a capital E. It is a state function. All right, so a few other examples that we would run into for state functions that might be real familiar with you in this chapter. The total internal energy, I said that that was a capital E. Kinetic energy and potential energy, which you should have read about and have a definition for in your mind, those two are state functions. Temperature is a state function. Final minus initial, um, that, you know, if I want to know the change in temperature in this room, final minus initial. Pressure, state function, we used pressure a lot in um, our previous chapter and PV equals NRT, if you think back to that, pressure was a um, capital P. All right, so here is um, a picture here of people climbing up mountains and let's look at what it says there. We've got our definition, but we're, let's think about the change in altitude of these hikers. It doesn't matter what path they take. If they are over on the right-hand side of that mountain. You see they're trekking up. It's a really steep incline. They're going up path B there and climbing to the top. Um, the change in altitude is just where they finished final minus where they started. In path A, they're winding back and forth and back and forth to get up to the top of the mountain. So in that situation, they are taking a much longer trek up the mountain, but their change in altitude does not matter. So, the uh, distance they're walking is different depending upon the path they take. Um, and they can't just look at where they are at the end and where they are at the beginning and subtract to know the distance they traveled. Um, but what they can do is do the altitude. Another thing that is not path dependent or is the path dependent is how much work it takes, okay? If the, the back and forth and back and forth took 14 hours and they were still studying incline, but the one on the right was a one hour trek, it was pretty hard but it wasn't sustained over a long period of time, maybe path A was much more work for them because they had traveled so far, but they could succeed at it, where on the right hand side it was because it was a shorter trek, didn't take as much work, um, over the whole journey. Mm, that's debatable which way it is, but the path depends upon which way you choose to go. I mean, work depends upon which way you choose to go. Okay, so that is part one of our discussion of thermal, uh, the first law of thermodynamics, just getting the definition, getting this concept of state function and holding on to the fact that anytime you have a state function, you can do a delta of that state function, a change in that state function, and all you have to know is final minus initial.